uh, that we will be continuing this for every four weeks or maybe four to six weeks and uh, we will be we will be trying to present new services both from uh, microsoft side as well as other cloud providers as well as per the schedule we planned in, in long back when we were doing the uh, like the we did the survey around what people really want to know about so yeah so that that's the that's the plan uh, at this stage for today we are trying to cover uh, azure storage account which is one of the Azure services for managing uh, all sort of data. It can be your uh, flat file data, or it can be your uh, denormalized data, or anything else like images and stuff. So all those different aspects of uh, way in which data is persisted can be all catered using this particular Azure service, which is called as Azure Storage Account. So now what I'll do is I'll just do the presentation for this. I'll start the presentation and I'll hand it over to Tarun. So we can go ahead with this. So finally it appears. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. Uh, morning, everyone. Uh, for those who are not uh, familiar with me, I'm Tarun Aroda and I'm uh, the cloud solution architect uh, working with uh, PwC teams here. Uh, most of you have probably engaged with me in some fashion or the other. And uh, as Asif uh, set the context for us, uh, we'll be talking about Azure Storage today and uh, why storage is critical to the entire, uh, uh, I would say, value proposition. Because it's not that there is something which is available in the cloud technology and we got to leverage it. There are very strategic business reasons behind it and uh, the growth. Uh, there are tons of studies out there and uh, uh, the, the data for any business is growing even on personal side also you would see that the phenomenal growth of data from all the devices and all the services we are consuming this tremendous amount of data which is uh, available out there and uh, obviously there is some place where you need to store that and uh, there is potential to uh, exploit this data and come up with some innovative solution and businesses are adopting uh, cloud first strategies to actually come up with some solutions where they can unlock uh, some of the challenges which we see in the traditional environment as you would see on uh, the next slide uh, typically what you would see is in a traditional approach we have data silos we have incongruent data types there are performance constraints so these are some of the blockers which are not letting you uh, let's say achieve the real value from your data uh, what cloud storage does for you, or we are focusing on Azure cloud storage today, it lets you come up with a sort of <coughs> single hub, a central hub for all your data. And we would look at uh, certain examples today. Uh, we'll be talking about various uh, capabilities which are available, which enable this uh, uh, for your business. And we do offer support for diverse data depth types. And you don't have to reinvent the wheel in terms of what tools or, uh, let's say, solutions you have been using in your environment. So we work with your existing set of tools. And you can bring in, whether you are used to doing programming in certain type of languages, or let's say, in certain application, you want to uh, have some capability uh, to exploit uh, things differently. We do offer those sort of capabilities in the platform. And uh, last but not the least, uh, you are you have options, and I'll be talking more about uh, this. Uh, the scale is not at all a problem, and overall, we are looking at uh, lowering the cost. So one of the main benefit is uh, the storage costs are anyway going down. But with this, uh, what you do in cloud storage, there are capabilities uh, available with which you can have a sort of tiered model where you don't have to plan for the maximum capacity. You can keep on building and adding capacity as and when required. And you also have the ability to have a tiered approach where you can actually frequently access data, which is charged at a different rate. And you do have options to go for archival storage, where you can store data at uh, virtually uh, next to nothing cost. And that is where you can actually leverage some of these services. And we'll talk all about uh, these capabilities later today. Uh, so Azure Storage, the focus for today's session, it's a foundational block, building block for Azure. And it's not just something which, which has just come out. So we have, we, we eat our own dog food and our own uh, business services, uh, things like, and you can see some of the really big, big uh, uh, online services which are available in uh, uh, 
market from Microsoft today, Office 365, OneDrive, Xbox, Skype. All these services are leveraging Azure data, uh, Azure uh, uh, storage. And you do have number of uh, services which are available, whether it is SQL Data Warehouse, HD Insights, so that's uh, the Apache Microsoft implementation of uh, Apache uh, uh, project. Uh, and uh, you you do have uh, data lake stores. We'll be talking more about data lake stores. So all these services which are available in Azure, they are relying on uh, uh, Azure storage. So what we typically call internally is uh, a ring zero service. So so when we come up in uh, a new data center in any region, and we have over 54 regions available today, I think it's either 54 or 56, I uh, might be quoting the number wrong, but uh, each of these, uh, so Azure storage is uh, a ring zero service. So wherever, wherever there is a Azure data center, you would always have Azure storage uh, available as a service. So why that is important is that in some regions, depending on certain business priorities, certain uh, services light up at different time. So in Australia, East or Australia, Southeast, not every Azure service is available, but when we classify something as a ring zero service, which Azure storage is, and it is the foundational block, which we often talk about, uh, it is available in every data center around, Azure data center around the world. So some of the key things which Azure uh, storage brings to you, as I've been trying to point out, uh, you can achieve uh, pretty much hyperscale performance, uh, over 30 million transactions per second and trillions of objects it's handling. And this is not the most recent data. This is this number is far higher than uh, what is presented here. Uh, I did emphasize uh, that we do support uh, the ecosystem you are working in. So you have an open environment. You can reach the storage with your REST API, open client libraries. So any choice, choice whatever choice of platform you may have, whether you want to engage uh, with storage using .NET, Java, C++, Python, Node.js, all those options are available to you. Uh, something which makes your uh, security team pretty happy, we do support encryption at rest, uh, there is support for client-side encryption, and we do offer integration with Key Vault, which I think majority of the yes. engagements I have seen, you are relying on that, and uh, for your own compliance requirement, you need to enable this, so we do offer support on this front. Uh, we do support, uh, the last point is extremely important, uh, the entire hybrid approach which we uh, talk about uh, with Azure Stack, whether it's the uh, public hosted cloud or private hosted cloud, we do offer similar experience across both the environments. So in, let's say in case you are building a sort of hybrid infrastructure, uh, if you are deploying Azure Stack, Azure Stack, we, we would have a follow-up session on that at some stage. Maybe in a brief, what exactly is okay. Azure Stack, it will be more relevant. Yeah, to... okay, I can explain. So what happens is there are certain use cases for specific scenarios. You don't want to take a workload to cloud. Right. So what it can, what you can do in that stage is, uh, do we live with the on-premises uh, infrastructure? Mm -hmm. But the challenge then is, and this is something which we have learned from most of the customers, and this is what makes Azure pretty unique. Uh, what Microsoft uh, believes is a true hybrid story is uh, that you should be able to engage with your public cloud as well as your uh, on-premises infrastructure in the same fashion. So let's say if I'm developing an app and for some reason, one of the business case could be, uh, I have a global application and I want to deploy it in one particular region where there is no Azure data center. But because of data compliance requirement, I have to keep data within that country. I can't take that um, data out of that country. So how do we handle such a scenario? In such situation, Azure Stack becomes central. What it enables for you is that you can deploy that application. So you're deploying at 10 other data centers probably in Azure across the globe. But in that specific geography, let's say, could be a place like Vietnam, Indonesia, where they don't have a local Azure data center, but they want to keep the data within that geography. So you can deploy an Azure stack, which is an on-premises system. Right. So we have an ecosystem partner who would come and deploy and commission Azure stack for you. So Azure stack then becomes a sort of another region in your Azure portal itself. So that's a true hybrid experience. So you're not leveraging public cloud, but the beauty is you're deploying your application on-premise and managing it as a cloud application itself.
So what we are saying is it's like the Azure stack is more like a skimmed version of the Azure ecosystem, which is deployed on your on-prem environment. Yep. Take for an example, if I'm referring Azure storage with HTTP uh, Azure dot, uh, dot com yep. on, the, on the cloud side. Yep. So if I'm deploying the same Azure stack on my ecosystem, and if yep. you want to access the same storage account, yep. but it will be coming through my on-prem on system. So yep. it will be just a change in change IP in the URL, yeah. and that would be it. Yeah. So, so you would change. Just, yeah, you'd be just referring it to the Azure stack URL, okay. but in terms of, okay. and it's not just accessing the data, it's yep. the entire manageability and part of it, whatever practices, DevOps processes, data transfer, yep. ETL procedures you're following in the cloud, yep. same things are enabled for you in Azure Stack. So it, it's a consistent experience for you yep. across both on-premise and uh, your on-premises. Okay. We are not planned on that. <laughs> no, 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 no. uh, Sohail, do you have any questions? No, no. Okay. Yeah, thank okay. you. Uh, yeah. Okay. So uh, we are talking about. Let's build this slide through. So we are talking about various uh, storage services, and there are some more. I don't have everything covered here, and I have a follow-up slide. I'll be talking about this. But in simplest term, when we look at uh, Azure storage services, some of the services which are available to us are Azure Desk, which is like I have a VM, I have an IS workload. So IS and PaaS, I'm sure all of us understand. We we are working when we talk about IS, we are basically talking about working with virtual machines deployed in cloud data center. In that environment, you can pretty much attach the traditional way was we would create a storage account and we'll work with that storage account. Now what uh, has changed in last few years is instead of trying to actually manage storage accounts, you can actually work directly with something what we call it desk, a managed disk. Managed. So you do have an option of managed or unmanaged disk. Recommended from our side is a recommendation from our side is stick to manage this because it actually elevates some problems which you would typically run into some capacity issues which you would typically run into with uh, uh, storage accounts if you're working with them directly. So manage this is the preferred option when you're working with your IS uh, workloads. Azure files is another. So keep in mind, all these things exist in cloud. So even when you're talking about managed disk, it's a resource which you're provisioning with your uh, Azure portal, and you're just simply attaching that to your disk. Azure files could be, uh, and we have a demo on this uh, for you. Uh, what we'll be showing over here is, uh, it is a sort of an environment. So typical thing which you have is your file server. And if I want to move my file servers to the cloud, Azure file is the answer in that space. Why that is, uh, why a different offering is required? Because when you're talking about file server access, the core thing which we are looking for is SMB support. Yeah. So SMB support, SMB version uh, 3.0, SMB version 2.0 support, if that is required. So if let's say you want to have a user access a cloud storage, but it be treated like just like a file server, right. I can enable that for you using Azure file and we'll be demonstrating that. Later. So what we are saying is that if I have a server in PwC uh, infrastructure yep. in the in the on-prem environment and if I access that server from my machine, a shared drive on that server from my machine, the same experience I'll get when I try to access this cloud storage file, uh, Azure file from yep. the cloud, yep. if I mount it on my uh, laptop, like if Sorry. I mount that particular drive on my laptop, it will give me the same experience as I would get for From a local file server. Okay. And the, the I think uh, it's in the yeah. pudding, but yeah, 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 really yeah, yeah, yeah. eating it. Yeah. So that's why we'll yeah. be doing a demo. Yeah. And that's the first demo we would have later in our session where we'll actually be working with a cloud storage. I'll yeah. show you a cloud storage and we'll show how that is. So it's, it's not just all talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we will be showing exactly yeah. the experience. And let's say, let's see whether you agree with that assessment or not. Uh, so when it comes to PaaS services, uh, we do have uh, various options which are available, blob, tables, and queues, and we'll be discussing, we'll be spending a lot of time on uh, these elements, and uh, we'll be building uh, these things uh, as we go, go along. But I think uh, blob storage, think of it as uh, your cloud object store. So anything, whether it's your videos, uh, files, anything you want to put on uh, cloud, you can put it in blob storage. You have table storage, so in case you're looking for uh, no SQL store, um, so le typically, let's say you want to have a non-RDBMS, no SQL DB kind of storage, uh, you have an option of uh, Azure tables. There is another offering which is 
often which often creates uh, confusion we are not going to talk about that in detail today but that's cosmos db it does support uh, uh, something similar on similar line and the trend is to move towards uh, cosmos db rather than with tables but let's stick to azure tables for the time being that offering still exists and you can very well build your solutions around that uh, Azure queues, if let's say you're looking for reliable queues uh, for various cloud services, if you have applications and you're looking for a cloud uh, sort of an application, uh, sort of queuing capability, then Azure queue is the answer. And uh, I think we have two demos on table and queues. Uh, we'll be demonstrating this, uh, how these things function. And we have taken some very good examples of how this could be relevant in your business environment. So one of the things which I think so we should highlight is uh, when we create an account uh, or a storage account under a subscription, so that particular uh, storage account is one instance inside your subscription. And at this stage, what Azure provides is around like 200 storage accounts, which you can provision. Yep. So that's one of the good thing. And also to add to that, there is like you get 500 terabytes of space for all that different 20 storage accounts Mm. adding together so in a specific subscription you can have around 500 terabytes of storage account yep like storage space okay. yep. we can move forward we'll be covering this detail okay so as i explained the blob storage service it's the typical object storage platform and you can work with uh, pretty much store and serve your unstructured data whether it is uh, your application data or you want to have uh, some sort of images videos any sort of thing you can pretty much use block storage as your uh, first choice of uh, your uh, cloud storage there are different types of blobs also which are available we'll be talking about that as well but you can use this uh, as a platform for storing your backups archives uh, and big data analytics also although for big data analytics depending on the kind of uh, workload we are talking about we do have some other offering which is built on top of this and we'll be talking more about that a little later in the deck so uh, i would say let's let's hold on to the big data conversation for the time being uh, so if you big data conversation what i would say is if you have advanced analytics workload there's a different offering which is built on top of blob storage and we'll be discussing that in more uh, the detail so let's hold on to that particular bit for the time being as i said you have uh, block uh, blobs which is Typically, majority of your blob would be created as block blob. Most of these object storage scenarios are supported by this. So typically, all your images, videos, anything you want to put in cloud, all that sort of documents, spreadsheets, all that can reside there. Uh, you do have option of uh, multi uh, writer append scenarios and then in that case you can go ahead and create append blocks but if let's say you have an application which is looking for page aligned random uh, read and write scenarios then in that case you do have option to create uh, page blocks but in short i would say 90 more than 99 percent of your scenarios would typically be handled by your uh, uh, block blocks and so. so ideally we want to think about if i have a use case and which mm. particular block type i should use so we we do have some patterns right so block block blob something like if i have maybe one terabyte of a file one mm. single file so do it would be reasonable correct me if i'm wrong to use no, a no, block blob. Uh, then in that case depends on what sort of operations you do uh, what, what so blog blog what I understand is like it breaks your entire file into small chunks yeah and then hashing it up it's the responsibility on the cloud side yeah so when you are trying to retrieve it it will give you exactly the one terabyte file perfectly form looking for but yeah. yeah at the storage side it's all broken up into small chunks. Correct. Correct. so if I'm doing heavy loads it's better to use something like a blog blog so if Again, I would say uh, depends on the type of the workload. So, uh, for example, if I have a PhD, where should I save? Is, should it be a blog blog or append blog or a page blog? I would say you can put that as your uh, uh, block blog. Okay. 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 So, append blog would be more like a log. Sort yeah. Of thing. So, yeah. if I have if let's say you log, are doing some transaction I logging have. and stuff like that, then append log would be okay. a more suitable option for right. you. So, anything like a multi-tenant web application where millions of transactions are happening, and you're just 
it's uh, event yeah, blogging. Or let's say you have something like something coming from Event Hub stream. Okay. And so that could yeah. be another example. You are just streaming it right. and you can just store this in your event blog. And you want to have a sort of timestamp uh, and just addition. Timestamp would be there for other things as well. Right. But this is like you are just appending to the existing stuff. Right. Yeah. And so more of a streaming data or audit data, right. that sort of stuff can reside in your append block. And what about the page block? Like, because what we are trying to just analyze is if we have a real world use case and we are trying to provision a storage account with one of these block types. What so if you are doing object stores, mm -hmm. go with block block. Okay. BHDs, I would still say manage disk is a better yeah, option. Yeah, yeah. You work with the manager yeah. rather than trying to work directly with the storage account. You might be. Uh, working directly with the managed disk and that might be a solution for you. Uh, let me think of a good example for uh, page blog for your business. Uh, because uh, my my understanding was that page blog is good with the read, random mm. read sort of things. Mm. So like uploading a VHD is one, like it, it can be uploaded in the blog blog as well. But yeah, page blog because it can randomly. Let read. me check on that okay. one. Let me verify that yeah. because that could be a scenario. Uh, but it depends on the workload. Right. That's right. that's why okay. I was trying to avoid yeah. that. Yeah. And some of it, if you look at it with the advanced analytic workload, yeah. I would recommend data lake store. Okay. Then that's that's right. the other option. Okay. So we we don't have just this option. Right. We do have data lake okay. store also. Okay. So. That's why I was trying to avoid just giving that uh, recommendation. So right. for analytics workload, we might consider data lake store as uh, the more affordable option than blog. So Perfect. again, hello Karun. Yeah. Uh, I've got a quick question. This is Jet. Um, yes, the yes. throughput, the throughput of uh, block and page blobs uh, were known for for many years as 16, 60 megabytes a second. Mm -hmm. Is this throughput uh, being considered? reconsidered or because I, I remember in one of the conferences they said in the future they're planning completely to rem, rem, completely remove that because yeah. we have VM throughputs uh, and uh, and throttling based yeah. on the VM size so basically yeah. this would simply you have kind of now two yeah two, so two, two how we have addressed that uh, if you just stay with me uh, let's park this for a little later part, we do have a section on innovation and we would be okay. talking about some of those. Uh, okay, uh, I, have, I have another part of the question. Uh, yeah. Blog blobs supports lifecycle management and page blobs does not support. Does that mean that the uh, blog blobs has some uh, metadata fields that uh, you're using for lifecycle management? for deleting all the uh, block blobs versus page blobs because we have a situation where we have multiple um, uh, multiple backups in page blobs and obviously this particular uh, poly these particular policies are not apl applicable because they are not block blobs and conversion only possible if we start backing up as block blobs with the SAS keys I think that could be a scenario where you can possibly consider a page blob uh, because you are looking for uh, uh, additional information to be captured, but uh, is it uh, the what sort of backups are we talking about here? Uh, not uh, typical native SQL backups, uh, and there okay. are two types of backups. When you provide credential, it backs up as a page blob. When you yeah. provide the uh, credential as a SAS key, uh, shared shared key, then it, yeah. it backs up as a block blobs. And when you back up as a block blobs with the storage uh, version two, you you'll be able to enable the lifecycle <coughs> policy, which is uh, deletes uh, or does whatever you want. So yeah, I, I, I was just assuming that block blobs has more why, extra metadata. Yeah, so why I would say that is because uh, when you're doing with shared access key, you want to have certain policies set, right? You want to have some policies that it should uh, be accessible only for, let's say, there is a specific password associated with it, or you want to put set a time duration for which it needs to be maintained. So for capturing those kind of information, probably then it is actually switching to block block. But for your typical backup scenarios, you might be better off with page blobs. Yeah, no, no, I understand. But I'm just saying that page blobs does not support policies enabling at all. So basically, policy is, is blind on the page blobs, and it just only be able to see block blobs if it's in a storage. So if you apply version 2 and have uh, lots of page blobs with the dates uh, back like a couple of months ago and you say please delete anything uh, older than 30 days, it will not do anything because it's looking, it's looking for blog blobs, not page blobs. Okay. 
let me let me verify that yeah, let's, let's just verify that so thanks for sharing yeah. that use case but we can verify that particular thing yeah it's uh, very 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 sensitive for us because we we're trying to implement the life cycle and yeah. the long long term retention for our uh, like uh, in house uh, backup solution so for long term okay. retention does it still uh, you're you're maintaining that what what sort of peering you are going for uh, we have a Could one storage account for archiving? which uh, yeah, 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 we 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 use a uh, hot for the um, for the thirty days, and we created another storage in Melbourne, which would be using for cool storage. Yeah. Uh, we would be keeping for one year, and then uh, we would be moving to archive uh, yeah. on in the same storage. Um, yeah. But the the main thing is just to somehow make that uh, cycle to work. Uh, yeah. So when they are in a, in a cool state, we want to make sure it's kind of a be able to delete or in the ones that in the hot state, then be able to kind of a rid of those because synchronization is taken care between the storage accounts. The yeah, only thing so is just that we need to make sure that there is no like a older than certain date. And the problem is that we already tested that page blobs are not uh, pick, picked then up by the policies. I would not make that conclusion. And that's the reason I was asking if you're implementing tiering, I just wanted to check whether it is related to tiering or whether it is to the type of blob storage. So let's verify okay. that. Let's take let's that take offline. offline. Yeah, sure. Let's Thank you. Offline. I can work with you on that. And uh, I just want to be double sure what you're saying, what you have observed. Is it just the type of the blob which is affecting the behavior or yes, is it that type of the blob? Of yeah, because we, we simply selected delete and that okay. deletion did not even pick up. It says it's not. But as soon as we put, uh, we convert it into the block blobs, the policy mm. start, uh, started working. So it just picked up uh, those those particular blobs. We can back up SQL also with that, but it just takes uh, more time because everything is now, it's around page blobs, not uh, block blobs. Okay, so let's let's discuss that. Yeah, offline. I don't want to yeah. <laughs> take all the time. No, no, that's all right. Yeah, that's all right. No, the thanks for bringing that scenario. That's that's helpful for discussion. Perfect. Thank so you. Let's take that. Uh, yeah. Let's all right. Forward. Okay. So and when we are working with our uh, applications, there are uh, when we are looking at storage options and what uh, cloud storage options are there. These are some of the considerations which uh, you would actually be looking at. Uh, uh, I think I don't have to spend too much time. It's like uh, when you're taking uh, stuff to the cloud, these are some of the things uh, which you would be uh, typically considering. Uh, I think definitely high availability and DR, we'll be talking more about that. We will discuss in detail how we enable this and how this is uh, simply much, much better option for you than trying to do this on premise. Because every time a data is written, even let's say as simple as locally redundant storage. So there are different types of uh, options which are there. I'll be discussing that in detail. But let's say even if we take the simplest option, let's say you're not going for any DR or anything, you're just going for locally redundant storage. There are three copies of the data which are maintained in the local data center itself. We'll talk about this in more uh, details. And again, uh, you don't have to. Traditionally, what happens in uh, your uh, on-premise environment, you would have to plan for, uh, let's say, uh, your maximum capacity scenario. Uh, you have certain uh, event or some particular uh, time of the year where certain level of uh, performance or storage is required. But rest of the time, you don't need that performance. So I think that's more true about the compute side of things. But here with the tiering structure, you can still handle your burst scenarios much better. You can scale up and down as required. So you want to have urgent capacity burst, uh, you can handle them better in cloud than you would typically be able to do that in uh, on-premise environment. Again, your audit compliance thing. I don't think I have the certification slide in today's deck, but in terms of compliance piece, uh, as a platform, Azure works at a global scale. Uh, we try and uh, we have, uh, if you get a chance, just uh, look at the Azure Trust Center. We have compliance at global level itself. And even at the local level, we are uh, uh, IRAP certified. We have completed IRAP assessment with Australian government. So Australian government's protected workload can also be hosted in this storage. So if defense can, Department of Defense can host these workloads in the storage, you can rely on uh, the security for this piece. Any? It was just in context of the PwC piece because yeah. <laughs> we, we, we have just additional attributes which we need to consider in respect to the security side of things. 
So if you are uh, trying to consume uh, this service, Azure Storage Service, and if you want to persist any sort of data into the storage account, maybe in, in, inside the blob or maybe inside a file, so one of the fundamental things which you'll have to consider is what sort of data are you trying to deal with? So whether it's, uh, so on a high level, we have three different DC classifications. So the data classifications we have is DC one, two, and three. Now, when we say one and two, those are like not very highly confidential. So something like regular information, your, maybe your name, your address, not address, but your name, your uh, uh, your basic details and stuff like that. But suppose if we are talking about a staff data and we are talking about maybe his bank account details or maybe his uh, social security or it's his uh, TAN number, so tax file numbers, so TFN numbers. So if these are the things which are in your data set, then it's not normal DC1 or DC2, it's a DC3 data set. So if you're trying to build your solution, if you're trying to architect it around and use storage accounts, so better to look into how would you secure the storage account on top of whatever cert certifications which uh, Tarun was talking about, because those are like, Gen generalized certification which uh, like industry level every industry expect that but for the security team which we have like the nis network integration yep. security they have specific guidelines so what that means is if you have a dc3 classification like bank account details and stuff uh, you need to mask your data before you even put it in the cloud your specific storage account should be vnet enabled so that should all be locked down and not accessible from the public cloud uh, you should definitely look into like what sort of auditing is happening on the on the hindsight. So what sort of audit is there? Maybe uh, Tarun, we will walk through around the audit yep. piece once we do the monitoring, uh, in, like monitoring service. But yeah, all that auditing piece is very important. So all that fundamental things are really crucial. So if you're trying to solution your uh, particular requirement around with the storage account service, better to look for what sort of data classification you're dealing with because you might build your entire solution do a lot of work and then you might go to the nis team and they will just throw it off the window because you don't have the, that particular uh, specific security guidelines covered so yeah be, be mindful about that we have already used a couple of uh, uh, scenarios with storage accounts so just to be uh, a bit clear, JED has been involved from day one. We have been working on a lot of storage account requirements for data classification one, two, and three. So at this stage, if any project wants to use a storage account for any of the data classification, you will not have to reinvent the wheel because we have already uh, found what are the different requirements on the PwC side and how they can be catered. Okay. All right. And for DC3, just a quick query on that one. Um, did you find everything? So today, if let's say you want to host your DC3 data in storage, yep. uh, it's approved for that purpose or yes. you have to, with certain conditions, so as such, is, I understand. Yeah, the, the interesting part is there is no one generic rule that, okay, if you have VNet and if you have uh, bring your own key and if you have encryption, that's all good for any data. So mm -hmm. that's a very specific use case. So what, what we need to understand is any project, even if you know this data classification has already been used by another project, still you'll have to run through the NIS process yeah. and they might say, no matter because it's the same data, but still you'll have to have this additional level of security. And there might be a genuine reason around that because it might be coupled up with a specific data set, which yeah. makes it more qualified to be highly secure. Yeah. So I think uh, on that, I would uh, definitely like to point out there are certain things like which are uh, uh, available today apart from storage. So storage is one element, but uh, this might be for future conversations in the similar area. There is, let's say, if you want to build a dedicated HSM solution in Azure, we do support that as well. Okay. There is a service which is now available in Australia right. to do HSM in the cloud. Okay. Uh, and so Key Vault is just one part of the story. And the other thing, if let's say you want to have hardware level HSM as well, um, again, there are certain challenges around batch services consuming right. uh, that dedicated HSM. Yeah. But the, those things are also work in progress. So the key vault would be currently it is FIPS level two compliant. At a later stage, there are plans to make it uh, FIPS level three compliant itself. So that is another level of security. So there is work happening on that front as well. Perfect. Nothing related to storage. It's other yeah, services yeah. we ended up talking. But yeah, I, I think uh, yeah. one of the fundamental way how you should go forward with if you are trying to architect a project using any of these other services, build your prototype, like maybe a mm. couple of boxes, 
call in a meeting, ask uh, Tarun to be a yeah. part of it. You like involve Jet and even an IS team. Yeah. So if on the very nibble side, if you are failing, it's like you are spending less time and failing quickly. So you have enough time to then rebuild your solution. Yeah, and uh, engaging with us is important because what happens is uh, things change fast. So something which let's say you ask me today, six months down the road, there are additional capabilities in the platform. So don't rely on, let's say, something which we discussed a year ago, it's history. Right. Things have moved on so fast. So, uh, and we'll talk about storage specific stuff today, but there are a lot of things which are happening on the platform. And on a monthly basis, there are so many updates which happen. So do reach out if, and discuss the scenario. If let's say in past other team didn't find uh, an appropriate solution, there are always new ways we can architect solution going forward. Okay, perfect. Just to yeah, we'll go cap on ahead. time, yeah. uh, we have, I think we can skip this slide. <laughs> we have spent too much. So this is about uh, uh, the typical scenarios which are there. Uh, we are actually, uh, we just have 15 minutes yeah. to go and we have lots of demos to cover. Uh, so you can refer to the slide later. It was pretty much all about uh, uh, the different use cases which are there and how different people are perceiving things differently. Uh, so this is the entire portfolio. We did cover some of this uh, previously and as I said, there is a follow-up slide I'll be talking about. I don't want to spend too much time on discussing the other options, but uh, uh, just want to point out for consistency purposes, if let's say you are using cloud volume from NetApp, we do have support uh, early this year, we launched this Azure NetApp files uh, as a first party service. I don't think you guys use that at uh, PwC, but uh, this is something which is available now. Data transport is an interesting option. In certain workloads, certain scenarios, this could play a crucial role. I've not seen this being used at PwC yes. right now. But what it does is, uh, just to give you an idea, when you are doing uh, some migration project or you are taking a workload from on-premise to the cloud, one of the options available, and you don't want to send this across the wire, you don't want to do, you do have an express route to Azure Data Center, so you can send it across the wire, but let's say if you have some concerns around doing it on the wire, what you can do is you can actually request Microsoft to, this is a service, data transport service, which is available. So it's an offline data transfer. We can send you a data box or a data disk, depending on the capacity which you need. So data box is like a sort of cage which is sent to you. You can transfer all your data into that and ship it to Azure uh, data center and it becomes available in your storage account. So that's one way if you want to do for very huge volume of data transfer, data transport could be an option and uh, you can consider that as uh, one way of doing things. Data box edge is, let's say you have a sort of hybrid or edge storage solution. Uh, so this is like if you are working with uh, um, in a sort of environment where it's, it's a disconnected environment and you you have some sort of edge storage requirement, uh, maybe some IoT applications uh, could be a good example for this. You can use some edge storage and uh, file sync. I have a slide on this a little later. So when we talked about Azure files in past, file sync is an extension. It's it's an enhancement of that offering. We'll be discussing that uh, in little detail. And previous, sorry, <laughs> uh, just going back, as I said, for object storage, we do have an option which we didn't have on the previous slide. We do have uh, data lake storage generation too. And this is now available in Australia. So. We did have data lakes Gen 1 for quite a, uh, quite a while and Gen 2 has been uh, made available and you can start leveraging uh, Gen 2 solutions as well. We'll be talking more about uh, data lake store as well uh, going forward. Uh, some of the examples, this is a quick slide uh, to give you an idea about what sort of solutions uh, and what sort of storage you can possibly consider. So uh, if let's say you're looking for some um, heavy analytics solutions, something like uh, running uh, a big data platform or even SAP for that matter, or you have some um, a Cloud Hortonworks uh, kind of a solution. Uh, now in those sort of solution, you may want to consider working with the uh, ADLS Gen 2. ADLS Gen 2 is Azure Data Lake Store. So you can work with that. ADF is your Azure Data Factory. So it is giving you different storage related services which you can exploit and we'll be demonstrating some of these uh, today in our discussion. For your typical uh, 
environment in which let's say you have lots of online transactions and you have a SQL server and this is like a SQL running on a VM, you may want to work with managed disk as an attached storage to your solution. Uh, different example, Kubernetes on edge, you may have a combination of Azure blob and managed disk. So you can be creative about how you structure your solution and it is not that one size fit all or one service fit all you can use a combination of various services so for certain element of your solution you may want to work with the blob storage for other elements of your solution you may actually be um, data lake so we do have some use cases which we'll be covering um, over here okay. some of the top level consideration uh, we'll keep it brief at this time uh, we do support uh, top level directory and isolation structure in form of containers so every blob you you are creating a separate container for that support parallel multi-part uploads and range gets uh, blobs are mutable and you do have support for e tag and timestamps with whatever data uh, you are putting in that and it does support locks for time and infinite uh, durations as well okay i think it's a good time to rather than doing all the talk let's switch to a quick demo so can i present i can do it uh, so i do the have first a one is about uh, files so yeah. if you can walk through what exactly are we going to do yeah so uh, this is the first demo which we are showing is actually i'll show you uh, two things over here uh, we can actually walk you through Azure file. Yeah. So I'll, I'll just do a walkthrough of uh, how storage looks like. We'll create a file share. Mm -hmm. I do have a file share already created and we'll show you how do we map that uh, onto our uh, uh, machine itself. Yeah. So typical file share access, working with the cloud storage, the scenario which we were previously talking about, that's the first scenario which we'll be covering. And the second scenario, what you are covering in that. Aspect. Yeah. So second one is more about uh, serverless web app. Now, uh, when we understand, when we think about a web application, it's mostly like you need to have uh, IIS or you need to have Apache somewhere running, which would then process your particular file request and then give back uh, HTML, which the browser will then paint for you. Now, uh, in, a, in a general note, you might be having a scenario where you don't need to do a lot of server-side processing and you just need maybe uh, to just somebody uploads a URL and then the image is showed on the web page. That's what the example which I'll be showing. So in this scenario, we don't even need a Azure Web App or IIS or even uh, Apache or anything. It will be just uh, Azure Blob Storage where I'll be uploading my a vanilla HTML page and then blob storage will serve everything and it will just make the web page run for displaying an image or something. Okay. So that's some sort of lightweight things which can be done with blob storage. Okay, so can so, I present? Yep, now you can. I'll just be. Uh, okay, yeah, you, you can. Presenter. You can, are you, are you in? I'm in, yeah. but uh, I don't uh, have the option to just, uh, your presenting. Click on that. There is no option. No, yet. just on this one. Okay, this yeah. one is yeah. okay. Sorry guys, I'm not that used to Hangouts. Yeah, you are asking. <laughs> yeah. For obvious reason, I don't use uh, Hangouts. Yeah. <laughs> we still don't have teams, so you'll have to work with us. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. I thought um, you can't overwrite. Uh, one. Okay, I need a separate button or something for that. Okay, so I'm just bringing up my screen. Okay, so in simplest term, what I have over here is I'll just walk you through what I have on the portal. So this is uh, just a portal, and uh, it might be a little slow because I'm working off my mobile device. So. Uh, don't judge the performance of the portal from this uh, because it's just being accessed over the mobile device. Uh, so this is a typical portal which I have and as you can see uh, I have configured uh, services here. I'll just go into uh, my if, if let's say if I'm creating something new I can go ahead and uh, create that resource from here and okay this is painfully slow. Wasn't this slow earlier in the day? <laughs> I'll just show the resource group so you can look at um, what I have over here. The refresh is also taking sense. No? Yeah, it's not refreshing. 
uh, on the screen itself, uh, is there a problem? Because it's not refreshing. I'm on a different screen, and the screen over there is mm -hmm. not. Can you just go to that? Uh, uh, I get into the signal here. Yeah, signal is also very weak in this area. Yeah, it's, uh, I think the signal is yeah, really no, poor. Yeah, ev everything is running through your phone, so yeah. even the Hangout. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Uh, so what I have done is I've just created a storage demo RG, and I've created certain resources in that. Um, you guys, should yeah, I there's a bit of a lag, lag. So yeah, be with us. Sure. Yeah. Uh, the thing is, I can log in uh, onto your machine and do the demo. Yeah, yeah, I'll exactly. just log yeah, into exactly. this because this is extremely. Uh, but again, you would be that SMB demo might be a problem. Oh yeah, yeah. SMB because be what we are doing is your firewall might not permit uh, okay. that thing. Uh, yeah, this is painfully slow. <laughs> Should be coming up. Oh no. Uh, Yeah, because it's taking too long to come up here because of the hangout mm -hmm. and right. portal access. Uh, there is no way I can actually do this demo with uh, this speed. Uh, so, okay. let's keep mine right at the end. Okay. If we have time, yep. let's cover it yep. because otherwise it will slow down everything. Okay. You do your piece because trying to do it off the mobile and hang out also on the mobile yeah. is not uh, helping. So yeah, I'll let you go then, yeah, I'll stop sharing. So, so sorry guys, what we'll do is we'll go with demo two because the demo one. Yeah, so in the end, we'll come back to demo, yeah. demo one. I'll try and showcase this uh, with uh, your Wi-Fi connection yeah. rather than trying to do it on the uh, mobile. Right, so the demo two is uh, we are trying to just present how we can run a web application directly from the blob storage without having any server engine or anything. So over here, if you see, this is one of the uh, storage accounts which I have provisioned uh, on the, that's again in my PwC uh, subscription, the, the Visual Studio free subscription which we get. Uh, if I go inside the blog, uh, you can see I have a container over here. It's uh, explore and learn portal. If I go inside this, you'll see there are a couple of files. So one is, this is the first one is the HTML file. And then we have an image file. So what we will be doing is we will be uh, running a web application, uh, a, a HTML page. So the, it looks something like this. So if you see over here, it shows that it's coming from explore and learn uh, storage. It's a blob type. And then that's the explore and learn portal.html, which you are seeing over here. Now, when we, uh, so you can see it's like it's directly getting served from the blob storage. Nothing is, uh, it's nothing under the hood. Uh, again, if you see on this uh, the URL, which I have defaulted over here in the text box, it's again coming from explore and learn blob storage. And it shows that it's a ext.jpg, which again is a file in the storage account over here. Now, if I just click this, it will, uh, it's, a, it's a simple JavaScript, which I've written in the back. What it does, it takes the image from the storage account, reads the image, and then it shows it on the browser. So without any, any sort of server side engine, Processing this, it's all simple JavaScript and stuff. Now, I I've, I was watching a couple of sessions around this space, like how we can realistically build a, a, a solution, not like a hello world or something like this. Uh, a realistic solution would be more like you can build your entire web application using two specific services. So one is you can build your HTML pages, dump it over here in the blob storage, and then all your server side processing you can do using Azure Functions. So without any specific environment for the processing side. It's just a REST request which will go from this browser to the um, to the Azure function and it will build the specific responses for you and then you can process it on the client itself. So what you are doing is you are taking the entire load of processing from the server side which conventionally is done on an IS or uh, uh, Nginx or uh, yeah, Apache and, and that all processing uh, heavy lift is all done by the browser which is running on the client side itself so it makes things quite useful you are reducing amount of like costing if you are trying to build a very cheap and low cost uh, portal it can be done in this way as well 
So that's one of the way how you can uh, you can work it out. The other piece which I wanted to show was around. So even consider you have uploaded your file and you want to make slight changes. So it's the entire blob is accessible and editable over here. If you see that's the HTML which is displayed on the screen if you want to make any changes. So take for example, if I just want to make a change and I want to say it one, what I do is I do that, click, it's uh, it's something like uh, people say when I make change, I make change in production. So it's something like that happening over here. So that's the update to that point. So yeah, that was a quick demo for the blob storage. Uh, it, it can be used in one of the better ways and just to be a dump spot for dumping files. Yeah, you can get even serve, get the SAR files served as well from the blob storage. And uh, do you have a storage explorer installed? Yes. Yeah, if you can just walk through the storage explorer, that would be helpful. Uh, so on, on, on the machine, no, I don't. What I do is uh, I would just was... Oh, you'll show the preview itself. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> there are two ways. What Karan was talking oh. about was uh, MSI, which you install it on your machine. So once you install the MSI, you'll get a similar experience, which okay, I'm about. Now I think I'm on your Wi-Fi. So okay. let me try and do that. Okay. It's like I do have the storage explorer yep. installed. Uh, I'll see. Uh, I might have problems still connecting to that uh, yeah. SMB, but uh, oh, I will we'll try and present. Okay. Okay. So you should be able to see this over here now. I'm presenting, hopefully. Mm -hmm. Active. Yeah. So yeah, click it present now and entire screen. It's slow. Yeah. yeah, I'm connected to your PC network, so it should come up. Okay, so I'm in. Uh, let the screen come up. Okay. So as you can see, I'm actually in uh, my uh, storage uh, in resource group. I've gone ahead and created a storage account. And in that storage account, uh, these are the details which are available. So as you can see, I have it available, created as a locally redundant storage. And it is a storage V2 account. And this is a subscription in which I have gone ahead and created this account. So I, as you can see, you have various blob containers which are available to me. I can create different types of blob containers. I can have file shares, uh, tables, and queues. Uh, one of the way to engage, as Asif was uh, just about to uh, show and I was interrupting him, uh, is work with the Storage Explorer. So I have Storage Explorer, which is installed on my machine. I'll just bring that up. So this is something which I have uh, configured. So this is a separate application and uh, the preview version of this is now available in the portal as well. Yeah. So was, what Asif was showing you was this application within the portal. So you can go into this from the portal itself, but that one is in preview. So you can very well see that I have this uh, file share which is created. Uh, so this is uh, my block containers, my file share. So I've created this file share and I have some files which are available in that particular uh, storage itself. I can access them from here and on the uh, user side, I have map. So this PA demo share is nothing but, as you can see from the URL, it is actually mapped to that specific uh, folder in Azure Blob Storage. So the, sorry, Azure File Share. File. So I have mapped a file share and I'm able to access that as a map drive on my machine. Can you show the portal as well? Because these two files yep. should be there. In the yep, portal. that's that's what I was showing. Okay, so yep, they'll be there in the portal as well. So Storage Explorer and I come to the portal. Yeah. Asif just doesn't trust me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I come to, so I think there is a lag on the screen. Open an Explorer. Uh, you just go to File Share. Yeah, yeah okay, File Share yeah, should be there. Yeah. And this is the file share. Yeah. And okay, it's actually going to different screens. Storage account. Okay. Ooh, storage Explorer. That's the. Uh, no, I'm just going to the Storage Explorer. It will be through the portal okay. itself. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's uh, taking so actually the, till the rendering on the browser doesn't complete uh, the Chrome box doesn't pick. 
it uh, edge related problem or uh, this was maybe maybe could yeah. be edge related yeah. thing because i'm doing the demo of edge you should use chrome <laughs> <laughs> but it is the same thing it is like instead of using yeah. uh, that thing in the portal mm -hmm. i'm just using a console yeah. application yeah. so this is the same storage explorer which yeah. is available to me yeah. so this is the stuff if if you can see this is the account i'm connected to on the cloud side right so pretty much yeah. what you would see in the portal. Yeah. So this is on the server yeah. side. Yeah. I was planning to show a data transfer also, yeah. but given the performance I'm getting, I'll avoid doing that yeah. as part of the demo. Okay. Uh, so let's move back to the deck. We have uh, just about 33 minutes remaining. Uh, yeah. If you can stop sharing. Just... Yeah. Well, I could override you. You can't. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I can. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> You're just being polite. <laughs> <laughs> Don't want to give you any surprises. <laughs> okay, that's fine. So next, we take a quick look at uh, the data lake store, and we look at some of the use cases where it could be useful. And as I've been trying to point out, so for your analytics workload, this is uh, the right sort of storage you would probably want to consider. And pretty much no limit on the data store side. And it has a global footprint. Uh, you can uh, use it in majority of the data centers. So currently, it is across uh, about 50 regions in uh, Azure. Uh, the the best part is you can bring in your open source uh, advanced analytic tools also into play to work with Azure Advanced Analytic uh, Data Storage. So if let's say you are using Apache Kafka or HD Insight, which is Microsoft implementation of Hadoop uh, open source project, you can use. So it basically offers you an HDFC, uh, HDH, uh, not HDFC, HDFS compliant yeah. API uh, for your uh, storage. So let's move on to the next one. And it is built on top of uh, your blob storage foundation. So you can clearly see that this is something which is offering you a Blob API as well as your Gen 2 API, which is basically Hadoop file system compliant. So it does bring in the entire file folder hierarchy as you would see in, in your open source environment. That entire thing can be, so if let's say you, you are running some map reduce job and doing some heavy high-end analytics processing, you can use this store. Uh, does support AD integration, Azure AD integration, your Typical standard stuff, RBAC, uh, role-based access control, and uh, you have uh, storage account security. All those things are, since it is using the same fundamental block, it is bringing all those elements into the table. We'll talk about the redundancy part a little later in the slide. Uh, in terms of if you are trying to build in, so this is an example. This is a sort of use case where you could actually have multiple services collaborating to give you a sort of more modern data warehouse uh, experience. So you could have your Azure SQL data warehouse uh, and Azure analysis services working and giving you visualization and Power BI. And you could have open source tool. You could have Databricks running in. You could have entire storage being there in your Azure Data Lake store. And you are consolidating everything, whether from your on-premise system or from other cloud services. You could be using Azure Data Factory to bring that data into data lake storage. So this is how you can actually structure a modern data warehouse solution uh, into the cloud. Another example of advanced analytic. Sorry, <laughs> previous slide. Uh, another example, uh, which is you how you are actually using your various models. So you could have. Uh, polybase, uh, uh, polygot sort of a, uh, approach to managing your entire data. You could still, uh, instead of using uh, any other thing, you could be using Cosmos DB and you could make uh, globally distributed applications very easily and uh, serve those applications. So Power BI was one instance. If you are doing other applications, you can uh, very well use a similar approach. But again, there could be tons of tools and options which are available. You can be as creative as you want. Let's look at, uh, there was a question rely, uh, related to performance. We'll be talking about that. But let's look at availability, durability, performance, scale, and cost when it comes to each of the storage type. So in terms of uh, availability, we do. We did briefly mention that we have various uh, options which are available to us. 
Uh, in simplest form, we are keeping three replicas, which is the locally redundant storing, uh, storage. Uh, then you have uh, zone redundant storage. So when you are creating your storage account, uh, you saw that in the demo also, I was showing that I've created at LRS. So when you are creating your storage account, it is prompting you to specify what type of availability you want, whether you want zone redundant storage, geo redundant storage. So you can see the examples of what it is uh, offering you. With zone redundant storage, uh, availability zones was not available in Australia, but I'm happy to let you know it is expected this quarter. So availability zones should be available in local, I think for Australia East, it's coming to Sydney first. So availability zones feature, which was something which was not there in Australia is coming to Sydney. So availability zone is basically in past what we were doing, we had uh, redundancy, we have our data center in Sydney, we had our data center in Melbourne and we were saying you want to have redundancy, we could do a geo redundant uh, deployment. What we can do with zone redundant solution, uh, we could have availability zones. So within Sydney, there would be different availability zones which would be available to you. So different data centers within Sydney itself. So that option is coming up in Australia so now. when we say zone redundant, it's more like the same data center? No, data different data center. Different data center? Different data center. So it is, it is not, it is in the same geographic region, but not uh, within the same data center. So it could be, I think, uh, uh, it is slightly different from how uh, AWS defines it. In our case, it is going to be within the same city, uh, but the specs I can share with you. What it uh, it is slightly different in interpretation how right. AWS does it, but it is still within the same city. So if it is, uh, uh, let's say, uh, across Sydney and Melbourne, then it is not a zone. Right. It, you, it won't it won't be treated as a zone. It will be still a region. So right. it's a geo redundant uh, kind of a configuration. Just to show this exactly how it feels on, on the portal, what sure. I have is I have just set up uh, uh, a geo replicated uh, instance of storage account. So yep. if you see over here, it shows it's a geo redundant storage. Yep. Now, uh, and the best part is it's quite uh, graphical as well. So if you see over here, there uh, it shows two instances one is Australia East and that is Australia Southeast. Now, the, the experience which you're seeing over here, you'll only get that. When you are trying to provision your storage account, you should select geo redundant. Yeah. Because if you don't select the geo redundant during the provisioning time, later on you are not eligible to change that from local redundant to geo redundant. Maybe you'll have to make a service request, but it's yep. not self served. Yep. So over here, if you see, it's it's something like it's showing the blue dot and the green dot on the map, and it's showing Australia East and Australia Southeast, the Sydney and Melbourne data center, yep. and it's showing a replication. Now, considering the fact on our side when we do at PwC a solutioning, if you are designing a solution, one of the use case you ask your client is whether he needs a high availability and all that stuff for their specific project. So if a request is yes, we need, uh, one of the fundamental like high level we see that uh, each of the storage accounts which we see, they already have like 99.69 availability, mm -hmm. which automatically makes them like highly available and you will consider the fact and you will go with that. Yeah, this is already highly available. So we don't need to have a DR sort of situation because 99.9, .9, you can't go beyond that. Now, uh, in, in one of the use cases, I felt like I had such issues and then the client came back and said, no, uh, where is my replica? I don't see, I, like that's fine, 99.69 is fine, but still where is the replicated version of this? So in that case, we have to re-architect some of the pieces and we have to then make it geo-redundant. Geo-redundant yeah. with the read-only access? Yeah, yeah so okay. it was geo-redundant with read-only access. Okay. So, yeah. so that's what you need to consider when you are doing the design so that your implementation team just takes the right option so that they don't have to redo the things and stuff yeah. like that. Okay. So yeah. that's it. Yeah, let's go. Okay. So the other option uh, which we have over here is the geo redundant, which Asif uh, showed up, uh, showed us, and uh, finally we have an option with uh, geo redundant read only access. Yeah. So that option is also available. Uh, let's move forward. And obviously, it is pointing out the one which is the cheapest and yes. which one is highest. Uh, I think we missed the slide, yeah. So when you're working with your VM, there are uh, things which you can uh, plan. And this is all about uh, architecting. Uh, again, as he was talking about the storage side, similar thing applies to when you're working with the desks, managed desk. Uh, so in that case, what you can do is 
you have to take into account whether you are creating a VM or we are creating an availability set or you are using availability zones. This was not available to us in Australia. There is an option to create a VM scale sets also. So this is more of how you can actually look at various solutioning options which are available to you. Uh, obviously, you can see a single VM SLA, it is much lower than what you can achieve. So with a VM in a availability set, you can achieve better SLA and you can definitely have managed this assigned to different fault domains. So there is this concept of fault domain and update domains. What that ensures is that uh, if your machine, if your VM is on, uh, when you configure an availability set and you put them in a different availability fault domain and update domain, at no given point of time, your machine, uh, every machine in the uh, availability set would be going down. Application down possibility was. Yeah. So yeah. overall, your VM SLAs uh, would definitely be availability SLAs. You can accomplish better SLAs with uh, an availability set. And again, availability zone. And finally, there is this option of creating site recovery, ASR. You are using that at PwC today. So talk to your Digitech team and they can advise you more about this. But this is like having redundancy and much better high availability solutions. Yeah. And this, in case of a disaster, the other location simply comes up and serves your request. So again, a very fine solution for offering better SLAs. You just need to be mindful. We have 20 more minutes. Yeah, that's why. Right. <laughs> so, so let's uh, yep. uh, quickly run through the list. I think we did talk about, uh, uh, I think uh, this is uh, the query which uh, Ged had uh, earlier, where he was talking about what is the maximum object size and what is the kind of performance we can uh, accomplish. So there is some work which is happening in this place. Uh, you can see what are the current uh, object reads which are there and what are we expecting uh, by next year. So you would be able to have single object write uh, up to 100 gigabytes per second. And uh, this is something which we would be enabling in uh, Azure uh, going forward. Uh, Throughput, excuse me, Arun. Uh, I can't see 100 gigabytes a second. Sorry? Uh, this, the, is the, the this is H1 2020. Okay. So uh, next oh, year. I see, I see. But that single blob object read. Yep. Uh, what about the blob uh, uh, access? Because it's a 60 megabytes per second. That's the uh, troop of the stage. Uh, it says current 50 gigabit per second. It's hmm. something doesn't match. I think he, it's advertised as 60 um, when you do the blob. And so it's let's limited. Look at, let's look at uh, what you have configured yet and uh, let's discuss that because this is what you have uh, current at the moment is uh, there on the slide. And if you are not seeing that, uh, let's no, look at how not. To <laughs> let's, let's definitely okay. talk more and uh, discuss uh, your scenario and see why you're not able to get the throughput which is there on the slide. So, Chris has a question When will Azure offer disk expansion without shutting down the VM? Uh, so, is it uh, managed disks are we talking about or uh, um, Chris, can um, you come off mute? Yes, the um, automation at the moment, we're not using managed disks, um, but no. so no, we're not using managed disks at the moment. Yeah, so I think uh, let's check <laughs> if that yeah. limit is uh, something which you have with the uh, managed disks as well. A recommendation from our side is to actually switch to uh, manage disk. So what you're saying is you want to, uh, you have provision a lower capacity disk and you want to switch to a higher capacity it's disk selling. and uh, you want to uh, do it without the shutdown. Correct, yes. Yeah. Okay, I doubt that is something which is on the roadmap, but let me go ahead and check that. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, so just keeping time in mind, we have uh, 20 minutes remaining. I'll uh, give the key takeaways and uh, I think uh, key things to keep in mind uh, when you're migrating your uh, on-premises workload to cloud and you're looking for disk storage op options, we do have premium. Uh, so we, in, in simplest term, work with managed disk. We do have unmanaged disks which are available, but that's not the recommended uh, configuration to go for. So my recommendation would be go for managed disk. And in that, you do have option to go for standard or premium managers. 
premium as the name suggests will give you much better performance you do have uh, uh, standard ssd and premium ssds as well i can share links about pricing and you can look at uh, what are the various options <laughs> which are available to, sorry i want to spend a couple of more uh, seconds on uh, that slide in terms of uh, moving your file servers if you have a scenario like that you have azure files which are available you can use that as your uh, default storage option uh, if you're architecting applications uh, which involve analytics workload, look at ADLS. If you're looking for new cloud scale uh, interactive apps and working with the object stores, your blob storage should uh, do the job. So those are the options which I would map out. But in case you have some specific requirement, do reach out and discuss with us and we can help you architect that uh, suitably. Uh, so some more innovation stuff. Uh, how much time do you need uh, for that table? 10 minutes. 10 minutes, OK. I'll try and cover this. So as I talked about, premium SSD managed disks are uh, something which are available now. And uh, you have much better capacity and much better higher uh, IOPS uh, which are uh, possible. So in terms of uh, performance, uh, you can looking at running. So if, let's say, you're running your uh, uh, SAP servers or your database servers, backend servers, you would be better off working with premium SSD managed disks rather than the standard managed disk. So th these are some things which are available out of box uh, for you. Okay, we have uh, different. Uh, you can see the comparison with uh, premium. So there we are able to accomplish uh, twenty thousand IOPS with uh, standard SSD disk. You are getting six thousand IOPS. So this is something which you can consider for uh, workloads which are typical, your web servers, uh, your low IOPS application server, entry-level app enterprise application server. So again, size it right, and depending on what you're doing with a specific server, you have options available. So you can uh, reduce the cost maybe. Where you need higher IOPS, go for premium managed disk. Where you need uh, standard IOPS, meet your requirement. Uh, you don't need typical high level performance. You can work with uh, standard SSD. And these are the managed disks. In terms of capacity also, we have uh, much better capacity which is available now. And uh, you can see we have gone eight times higher in capacity. So compared to what we were previously supporting. And uh, we do have uh, larger disks which are possible. So larger disk size which was uh, previously a challenge. Uh, we have been able to support much bigger sizes as well. One thing which I haven't mentioned, uh, in Azure Files also, you do have an offering called Azure Premium Files. So there also, if you're expecting, uh, you want better performance from your file shares, typical file servers as well, you can go for Premium Files. So for certain application, that is, I think, I, I remember in US, uh, your team is using Aura application. And for Aura, they were uh, relying on uh, Premium Files. So. So there might be some application in which you might be better off working with uh, premium files. I didn't have that on slide, but that option is also available. I think we can uh, skip file sync. Uh, premium files, OK, here's the slide. <laughs> so uh, let's uh, premium files. As I said, if uh, you're looking for SSD-backed uh, file servers with low latency, higher IOPS, and uh, lower transactional costs, uh, this is the one which I was saying your Aura application in US is actually leveraging uh, premium files. So much better uh, throughput you can expect. And uh, this is something uh, where you want low latency. This could be an offering uh, which you can consider. OK, and I'll hand over to Asif for yep. bringing so, it home. <laughs> yeah, so uh, as Tarun talked about, there, there are potentially four majors uh, options in, in storage accounts. So we have blob, we have table, we have files, and we have queues. So I don't know, Tarun has already covered blob and uh, files. Now what we will be looking into is something called as tables. So uh, just to give a heads up on this particular uh, service in Azure is that eventually uh, there is a roadmap where uh, Azure is planning to migrate the table storage into Cosmos TV. So even today, Cosmos TV was initially kicked started from this table storage yeah. and before that it used to be called as document db mm. so it was doc db then table storage which then eventually is now cosmos db now the reason why uh, call, they are trying to put I think it's not just uh, the branding change uh, there are in terms of uh, yeah. it, it was a separate project altogether 
project Florence, right. which actually became Cosmos DB. Okay. But when Cosmos DB launched, all document DB was straight away right. converted to Cosmos okay. DB implementation. Right. So it offers much richer functionality than what obviously, simply document yeah, DB offers. Obviously, <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know the nitty gritty, but yeah, <laughs> yeah, on a high level, as an outsider, this is what. Yeah, no, this are, you're right. Uh, yeah. The day Cosmos DB launched, every document DB instance was a Cosmos right. DB instance. Right. But it is not just rebranding. Right. Uh, there was a separate project, and there are specific scenarios. Uh, in, at at simplest case, it's your no SQL DB. Right. So here, it is yeah. comparable to DB. Yeah. So just to make uh, the understanding about all these different things, which we are talking document DB or Cosmos DB or table storage, this is fundamentally a no SQL sort of environment. Now, what no SQL means is we all have been across with the SQL uh, sort of data structure where we have. RDBMS where we have normalized data sets and uh, we have child parent relationship and all that but then there is another format which in which the in, like enterprise as well as the rest of the world is moving and that is normally referred to as NoSQL. Now what NoSQL means is these are like JSON objects. They can be small JSON objects, large JSON objects and you have all the possible uh, like uh, what you do in, in, in a normal normalized database. You can do all that with the denormalized version as well but they have much more flexibility and much easy to consume as well as process because uh, going forward, if you see any of the cloud providers, whether it's AWS, GCP, or um, Azure, they are all working around the JSON format, whether it's it's considering building the infrastructure or building application or whatnot. So all that is running through uh, NoSQL, and uh, this is one of the options where you can persist a NoSQL data source. So if you have a JSON data set, whether it is a user data set or is it an infrastructure data set, you can persist it over here. Now, comparing it, uh, the, like this particular table storage which I was talking is about to become the Cosmos DB in a long-term roadmap there is a wide difference between the two now the table storage what we are referring over here is a part of the storage account so all the specific uh, boundaries which are uh, eligible for storage account it also works with table storage so take for example the overall uh, 500 terabyte of space so you can have your table storage which can consume that particular space and you can work out with large JSON data sets and all that, creating one storage account. The other thing is, in the Cosmos DB, it's a bit different because it's like a global distributed system. So uh, they, it has its own value over here. It's more about you have a small nibble space where you can create a small web application or you can create a small uh, transactional application. You can have your data in JSON format. You don't need RDBMS and you can play around and work with easily with this uh, table storage over here. So I think uh, the next part is about demo. Now what I'm trying to do over here is because I was trying to do the comparison between a, a, a relational database, which is a SQL instance, and then we have this another piece, which is a no, no SQL database, which is a table storage. So one of the fundamental question comes up that what if I have existing workloads and if I want to migrate them into a no SQL instance? I think we, have, we all know there are a lot of different tools which you can use to transform your relation database into a JSON format. It can be different reason why you want to do that. You can you might be uh, trying to archive it or you want to persist it for other reasons. But uh, now going forward, because there are a lot of services available from the platform itself, Data Factory does this magic for you. So there are connectors available with which you can connect the Data Factory to a SQL instance. It can be on-prem or in the cloud and then you can grab the data from there and publish it into a table storage. So that is the demo which, uh, which I'm trying to present now. And uh, I'll go back to the portal. Uh, so this is one of the data factory which I did create. And uh, just to show you, it's, it's quite simple, nothing much happening. What I was referring to was connectors. So this is what are referred to as connectors. So data factory basically uses, this is the SQL connector with which it is trying to connect to a SQL database. And this is the table storage connector with which it will try to connect to table storage, grab the data from SQL instance, publish it into the table storage. Now, just to show you that this is uh, this is a realistic database, and it's not mocked up. Uh, if you see over here, this is called as Explore uh, Learn SRV. That's the name of the database. And I have connected to that database using SQL Server Management Studio. So if you see, this is the Explore and Learn SRV database. It has, uh, and that's the server. This is the database, Explore and Learn DB. And we have one table inside that, which is called as TBL user, and it has around some 67 odd calls or something like that. Yeah, it should come in a while. So if I go back over here. 
So yeah, it has around 67 records. Now, if we go back to our uh, storage and if we try to look into uh, the storage account and if we go back to the tables and inside the table, if you see there should be uh, a table. Uh, yep, this is the table uh, um, which, which I've created. And in order to see what is inside this, again, going back to what Tarun was showing, you can have a storage account on your machine or you can leverage the preview version over here. Now, if you see it's all blank there's nothing inside this now what we will be doing is we will what we will be just running this data factory and hopefully if everything goes fine then the 67 records which we have currently in the database in a normalized data structure should go into the sql uh, azure storage table okay. in a denormalized format so i think it should be quite quick uh, yeah it's, it's maybe yeah it's already done so it went fine so now if we go back to this explorer and if we refresh this so now if you see we have around 67 records over here and this is a normalized now one of the question is like this looks quite uh, relationship database sort of uh, table columns everything but if you would have uh, been around the denormalized uh, no sql in, in database structure it basically runs around a partition key and a row key now that, those are the two potential attributes which basically identifies how a json is structured so if you want to write a select query on top of it you will be basically referring which partition are you looking into and what is the row key which you are after or you can even go at the attribute level and you can say i need an address or an age of 789 or something like that so the fancy term which gets thrown around is uh, polycut uh, persistence which basically means as uh, one type of database is not answer to all your uh, situation yep. Yep. so use the right sort of database source for the given scenario we are trying to work with. So traditionally, we have been trying to do everything with an RDBMS and everything works in RDBMS, but uh, going forward or the, the direction for the last few years, and it's not just Microsoft thing, it's an industry-wide thing, try and utilize the data source which works best for your use case. Okay. So in some scenarios, table storage might give you the right sort of solution or um, an OSQLDB might be a better solution than actually trying to work with an RDBMS oh, solution. Okay. So that's that's the thing, and all the platforms are offering you those choices. Right. Today. Yeah. So that that that's a good demo on the table uh, storage. Uh, anyone has any questions? Otherwise, I'll move to the next uh, piece, which is mostly about. Yeah. If anyone has any question, just throw on. I'll just continue with this because considering we have only six more minutes. Uh, this, this is the last topic and this is the, I think, so the holy grail. Uh, we covered almost uh, all of the four services uh, option which are available in storage. We have already covered the three. This is the last Actually, one. We covered four. We covered, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we covered managed desktop yeah, and we yeah. did talk about data lake store. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but yeah, on a high level, uh, yeah. In what, fact, we have created a lot of in today's session. <laughs> maybe. Hopefully not. But yeah, the last one which we have is Q. Now, we all know like uh, each of the service providers uh, in, in the cloud space, they have their own queues. And no matter if you use AWS, Google, or GCP, uh, Google or uh, Microsoft. So with Azure, there are a couple of different options. And sometimes it becomes a bit overwhelming because it becomes a bit of a confusion which one to go for. So if you would have seen, uh, there are there is something called as uh, message queues, uh, which are MSM queues, which was historically uh, a Microsoft product. I think people who work from the open source space, they knew RabbitMQ, which was another piece. Now, all of these were a bit of a challenge because you had to manage the infrastructure, you had to manage the queues, you had to manage that the service were running and all that. Now, this particular uh, Azure queues are uh, just an option uh, in, in a pass offering in the same scenario. So you get all the experience as you get in a normal RabbitMQ or a MSMQ queue. But the thing is that it's all managed and controlled and served by Azure. So you don't need to care about uh, the infrastructure, you don't need to care the service are up and all that stuff. And that is all done um, automatically by the Azure ecosystem. And the reason why we are covering all this in this session is because this all exists under your storage, storage account. Yep. If you can see the URLs, it is all addressed to your storage account itself. So that's how you access your queue, the storage account dot queue dot co dot windows dot net dot slash queue. Yep. So that's the reason we wanted to give you this yeah. thing. There are other things for, uh, if let's say you're looking at uh, building a sort of message queuing system, there are other options yeah. which are available in the platform. But since this all exists in the storage account, yeah. we didn't want it to slip out on these. Yeah. 
and we kept this in so yeah sure. as tarun is saying like the queue options are much more because there is something called a service bus there is event hub there is uh, yeah, event grid. grid so it's like you have a lot of options now where exactly uh, like I, I i can't be like very straightforward and say this is the only scenario which you, where you should use this but one of the scenario where which i feel this is quite useful is if you want to do a very lightweight sort of activity so take for an example you have a web application and the user submits something and you don't want to tightly couple it with the back end and want to process it in real time then this is one of the best place where you can persist that message for temporary uh, temporary duration and then you can have a background process which would take the message process it and then um, make you go to the next screens and all that stuff so if you want to do a decoupled web application better to use this service bus you can definitely use but you might be overkilling the power because it is much more capable than just processing your messages so this is quite a very uh, good use case for such sort of situation where you want to decouple your application and uh, want to work it out as it's listed it it works with uh, seamless with all the platform and uh, different languages so as like any other service in azure it works with dotnet node php ruby and everything it has uh, rest based endpoints so you have rest access as well and uh, just to be there is two more minutes this is the demo which we are trying to do uh, i just wanted to show that uh, in an ideal scenario whether you do a web application or whatnot if you are having a u queue based uh, decoupled model it's something like you have a producer where which is producing the messages and then you have a consumer which is consuming the messages so what i've done is i've created two console application one is a producer application another is a consumer application and, and what happens is the producer normally schedules at uh, and triggers after a regular interval of six seconds and it cre creates a message which goes into the queue and then the consumer runs every uh, eight seconds and then it consumes a message from the queue uh, and then and just displays it so that will be the next demo what i'll do is i'll quickly go through that so that we have the final thing also done so if i go to the queue you can see this is my queue and at this stage it doesn't shows any message uh, what i have over here is this is my publisher application this is my subscriber application and i'll just quickly uh, run both of these so in order to be visible i'll just try to make it small so that's the subscriber application and that's the publisher application and so as you see it's running on a schedule so it's just producing some messages okay so all right so that should be fine so now if i refresh this you can see i have message five and message six now the above, above one is, is the subscriber one it's just misaligned so sorry so if you see my this is my producer uh, application which has already created a couple of 10 messages so 10 messages there if i refresh now i have 8 9 10 the reader has only read till 7 so once it reads 8 then i and then we should not see the message 8 over here now if i refresh i see 9 10 11 12 so it's just the producer is publishing in real time and then the consumer can uh, process the messages as per the availability so it makes it uh, decouple and then it so where is the code running for for these console apps so it it's uh, it's running on the console itself it's all on my machine at this stage okay yep so okay. It, it's just a simple so basically you are using both producer publisher and consumer on, on the, your on the, laptop yeah. and using yep. the queue from the that, cloud. That's right. Okay. Yep. So ideally it would be much better scenario where the queue would be processed by Azure function or something which mm. would be running a different schedule or running through a message queue itself because you can trigger the function from the queue and your producer can be a web application interface where somebody would be submitting something or maybe update. Just to highlight the concept I think this does a good job of saying that we can use yeah, a, a yeah, it's, it's a, it's a, yeah, very useful way of decoupling your application and making it lightly coupled or no coupled. So that's, the, I think, so the last slide we had. That's the Q and A slide. I, yep. yep. Okay. That's we the have plenty of questions, and I think uh, there are a couple of questions. So I need to come back to Jed on that uh, performance part of it, uh, the the bits he's uh, discussing, and on Chris's question about uh, if Excellent. this is on uh, roadmap. Yeah. So I'll take that, and I'll uh, reach out to you guys. If there are other questions, uh, you have my contact details. Uh, yeah. I think. 
feel free, uh, free to reach out. Yeah, message me or uh, Tarun uh, either ways, and uh, we'll try to work it out the solutions. And we will start with the next uh, demo, which we expect to do in next six weeks. Six weeks, okay. Good to have that. Uh, and what's yeah. the next session we have in the series? Ah, uh, that's a good question. <laughs> I'll update you. I don't remember off the head directly. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thanks yeah. for your time. Thanks. And for, uh, hopefully, it was useful. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks, Raif. Thank, thanks, Tarun. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so stuff.